Life of Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Book 2, Chapter 3 The Wilderness Prophet The voice of John the Baptist ringing on the desert air came like a clarion call to a nation whose ears had been dulled by the monotonous chant of tradition-ridden priests. The prediction that God would redeem his promise and send the long-expected Messiah of Israel was, however, too deep-rooted to be more than temporarily obscured by the ever-growing traditions of the elders or the many perplexities of a subject nation. National feeling was intense. The Roman guard had to be increased during the feasts in Jerusalem and clusters of rough wooden crosses with their horrible burdens, particularly by the roadsides in Galilee, were a not infrequent symbol of the seething unrest. The lifeless casuistry of temple and synagogue and the relentless suppression by Rome had given little encouragement to the Jewish people. Never had they been more in need of that inspiring feature of their national life which had been taken from them, the prophet of God. The divine sentence had gone forth. Night shall be unto you that ye shall not have a vision, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the night shall be dark over them. The prophet had been an unpopular figure in Israel, not because of his revelation of things to come, but because he represented the voice of God indicting the people for their iniquity. Smitten by their evil conscience, the people had rejected and persecuted the messengers of God. Now, in the confusion of the dark days which followed their withdrawal, the nation was able to repent and assess their loss. It was to the prophets that they owed their hope of a Messiah and of the restoration of their nation to its former prosperity. Prophets had been the authorities to whom they could turn in times of national danger and perplexity. They alone in Israel had given them that sense of personal approach to God which maintained their conviction of responsibility and privilege. But though the prophets had left the national scene, their influence was still abroad in the land, maintaining in many hearts the message of the coming Deliverer who was to redeem his people and restore their lost glory. The scriptures clearly predicted that Messiah's advent would be proclaimed by a prophet in the wilderness who would herald his approach. John the Baptist fulfilled this great role, and in so doing earned from his Lord the signal tribute that no greater man had been born of a woman. He came in the true tradition of Israel's prophets, gaunt, ascetic, lonely. As foretold by the angel, he brought joy and gladness to many in Israel, but at the cost of personal sacrifice and persecution. Like many of his predecessors, he languished in the darkness of a prison cell, until his light was finally obscured by the insatiable hatred of a woman and the voluptuous pride of a man. From his birth, John was dedicated to his task by the Holy Spirit. At an early age, he renounced his priestly vocation and went into the desert, preparing himself for his work by a life of lonely asceticism, meditating upon the message of those who had gone before him and communing with God. Nor did the years pass without giving him an insight into the condition of Israel, the deeper motives of those who ruled, and the depravity and need of the human spirit. At last the moment arrived when the word of the Lord came to him. His vocation had begun. 
He went through the Jordan region preaching the baptism of repentance and proclaiming the coming of Messiah. The response was immediate. The whole country caught fire. Men and women came in their thousands into the desert from all quarters. Poor peasants from Galilee jostled rich traders from Jerusalem and soldiers from Jericho. Godly souls who had waited for redemption in Israel came joyfully to join the curious sceptics and the haughty tribes. They saw a rugged, sun-tanned prophet with tongue of fire and eyes of judgment. Impressed by the conviction and authority of his message, their hearts were stirred. On every side the cry went up, Master, what shall we do? John had only one answer, Repent and prepare. The thousands who responded to his message submitted to the ordinance of baptism in the waters of Jordan, a symbol of the washing away of their sins and their recognition of the coming of Messiah. In marked contrast to the teaching of the scribes, John laid emphasis not on what men did, but upon the spirit behind their actions. He condemned the smugness of the rulers in the delusion that they were the children of the patriarchs and declared that God was able of the stones around which the waters of the ford were swirling to raise up children to Abraham. It was useless to claim to be of Abraham unless they were like him. The only true test was in the fruit which a tree brought forth and the time had at last come when the axe was to be laid at the root of the tree. The message of John bore principal reference to the first coming of Jesus. He spoke no word of a conqueror who was to overcome the foreign tyrant, humble the oppressors of the people, and establish the worldwide dominion of peace and glory, which were the subject of so much Old Testament prophecy. His message concerned the relationship of individuals to God. It was a challenge to prepare for the coming of the one who was to sift the wheat from the chaff and to bestow infinite blessings upon those who received him. One day, as John was baptizing in Jordan, Jesus moved through the multitudes and appeared before him. Although it is improbable that John knew his cousin by sight, he would not be deceived by the one who stood before him. As he looked into the strong face and met the fearless eyes glowing with the light of heaven, the man who was satisfying the people's need felt suddenly conscious of his own. The man who searched the hearts of the penitents was filled with an overwhelming sense of contrition. I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me? The reply of Jesus is revealing. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness. In his baptism of Jesus, John performed what was virtually the final office of his ministry. The appearance of the dove lighting upon Jesus was the promised visible sign which identified Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God, whose way John had prepared. Thus John, whose work was almost done, was not without the satisfaction which is always the reward of devoted service to God. John's recognition of Jesus was not the result of years of meditation in the wilderness, nor of a careful study of the prophets, nor was it the last step in a process of logical reasoning. John insists, I knew him not. The recognition came as a direct revelation from God. He that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, 
the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. John had that experience, and because of it he said, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. We cannot leave this matter without giving it some examination from the point of view of Jesus himself and the work he had come to do. His answer to John's objection, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfil all righteousness, is the first evidence of his sinlessness. The multitudes had come to John confessing their sins and had submitted to the baptism of repentance. Jesus also submitted, but his baptism was not an acknowledgement of his sin, but the demonstration of his righteousness. No words of Jesus are without weight, and his answer to John indicates that it is in the spirit of humility that righteousness is to be achieved. This baptism among sinners was the preface to a greater baptism which had to be accomplished in the same spirit of humble submission to God's will, with the same great end in view, to fulfil God's righteousness. Unlike the first Adam who thought that equality with God was a thing to be grasped at, Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And thus joining sinful men, preaching the gospel to the poor, washing his disciples' feet and suffering the crowning indignities of his trial and death, he fulfilled all righteousness and brought to man the first fruits of a peace with God far greater than the harmony which Adam lost. Thus the greater baptism began. Luke records that as Jesus was baptised, he prayed. In this moment of complete surrender, he was in the presence of God. This sublime example should be in the mind of all who come to God by him. It indicates no merely formal obedience, but a sacred submission to the presence of God. As Jesus rose from the waters, God confirmed his righteousness from heaven and anointed him for his life of dedication by the gift of the Holy Spirit. From the age of twelve he had consecrated himself to his father's business. Now his ears were open to hear the voice that called him to embark upon the baptism of water and of blood, through which he would eventually take away the sin of the world. The words of the psalmist glowed with life in the spirit of Jesus. Lo, I come! In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. His father accepted him and illuminated his path with words which would bring exaltation to his burdened heart during the dark days that lay before him. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Both by water and by the Spirit was Jesus baptised, and henceforth all who would come to the Father through him would enter the kingdom through baptism of water and of the Spirit. Although John proclaimed that the coming one would sift the wheat from the chaff, he did not live to hear the full confirmation of his message from the lips of Jesus. I am come to send fire on earth. It is possible, however, that his disciples may have carried to him in prison the words spoken in Galilee, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. 
It is a strange paradox that when Jesus came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many, his coming left fire and sword behind. But when he comes again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, the final effect will be of peace and joy in an age when God shall wipe away all tears and there shall be no more death. Life of Jesus, Book 2, Chapter 4 The Trial of Faith With his baptism, the life of Jesus emerges in all its beauty. From now on, he will always be with us, and we shall feel the strength of his presence, though our dim eyes may not see the fullness of his perfection, or our dull hearts perceive the depth of his communion with his Father. We shall see rough men growing into saints as they walk with him we shall hear his words of instruction and comfort. We shall become conscious of his quiet confidence and healing power, and know something of the peace of God. We shall learn the true meaning of love in ministration, in forbearance, and in supreme sacrifice. And when at length we turn the last gospel page, we shall know that he is with us still. His invitation, come unto me, learn of me, echoes yet in the ears of all who will hear, growing louder with our greater need. The wisdom of his teaching is emphasised by the appalling disasters wrought by the wisdom of men, and the certainty and need of the kingdom he taught grow clearer with the passing years as the kingdoms of men crumble into ruin. His touch has yet its ancient power, and meditating upon him and the source of his strength, we can still find a peace and joy which contrasts strangely with the tumult and discord of the world. Immediately following his baptism, Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. This first period of preparation was completed at Nazareth. He had obeyed the call of his Father to begin the active phase of his great ministry. With the divine approval came the power of the Spirit, and now in the Judean wilderness the supreme test in the age-long struggle between good and evil had begun. There is a terrific urgency in that journey into the desert. It did not happen until Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Then he was driven. What a conflict! What final decision! We sense the atmosphere of strain in the Gospel narratives. Exaltation of spirit in the consciousness of his father's acknowledgement and approval was sobered by the assessment of the magnitude of his task. Days lengthened into weeks. So absorbed was he that physical needs were forgotten. Yet they took their toll, and when resistance was at its lowest ebb, he felt the full impact of temptation. It is difficult to visualise this scene without thinking of the earlier test of the first Adam. In the fragrant beauty of the garden of God, after a period of harmony with his Maker, with all the animal creation subject to him, Adam had failed when his obedience was challenged. Now, in the fullness of time, the second Adam climbs the rugged slopes into the wilderness. Its very desolation a symbol of the other failure, the animals no longer affectionate and patient, but, in Mark's words, wild beasts. And there he engages in that struggle which, in its final victory, is destined to bring harmony between God and his creation, 
in an age when the desert shall blossom as the rose, the cow and the bear shall feed together, and a little child shall lead them. There is no inconsistency in the fact that Jesus could be tempted with evil. The wilderness experience confirms that he was made in all points like his brethren. His victory there shows that he triumphantly withstood the assault of sin. There is no iniquity in temptation, but if temptation is parlored with, it quickly leads to sin. The more we allow fleshly instincts to occupy our thoughts, the greater the danger of compromise, and the desire to make terms is the first sign of defeat. In the wilderness temptations, Jesus teaches that the nearer we live to God, the shorter and sharper will be the conflict with evil, just as, conversely, the lower our spiritual condition, the longer will be our fight and the greater our danger. The Apostle John brings this principle into clear focus when he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. He cannot sin because he is born of God. John is not saying that it is a physical impossibility to sin, but that so responsive are our hearts to the love of God that it is a moral impossibility to sin. Jesus demonstrated this in the most exacting environment. The first temptation was more subtle than it appears. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. The hunger of Jesus was the cause rather than the object of the temptation. For nearly six weeks he had been lost to the needs of his body. Now he becomes conscious of acute hunger. If the stones at his feet were loaves in his hand, how quickly could the faintness of his body be strengthened? Yet the temptation was deeper than this. It lay also in the suggestion of doubt. Down in the Jordan Valley Jesus had heard the voice of his Father acknowledging him as his Son, and with the commendation had come the power of God. The uncertainty that increased with the lowering of bodily resistance could so easily be resolved by a harmless test which would at once relieve the ache in his body and the doubt in his mind. Jesus recognised the temptation as a trial of faith as well as of endurance and did not hesitate. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In direct contrast to the hungry Israelites who complained of their lack of bread, Jesus was content to leave his sustenance completely in the hands of God. His knowledge of the word showed him the way of victory, and his faith in it gave him the power to resist the evil thought. This victory was more than a momentary triumph inspired by a sudden challenge. It reflected a trust in God with which all Jesus did and said was instinct. With the authority of his own conquest, he could exhort his disciples, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat. Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. In resisting this temptation, Jesus brushed aside the suggestion that he should fall back upon the divine gift of power to ease his suffering. He desired no exemption from the common lot of humanity. He demonstrated his faith by a committal of his bodily needs into the hands of his Father, and he showed the power of God's word in the presence of spiritual danger. The triumph of Jesus points the way to victory in the lives of all those who follow him. We do not require the extreme rigours of the wilderness to tempt us to make stones into bread. Most men live by bread alone. 
and do not discover until too late that all is vanity and vexation of spirit. The true disciple learns that the flesh profiteth nothing, and the word of God communicated by his spirit and living in his Son is spirit and life. It is a supremely important lesson that the life is more than meat and the body than raiment. The battle was being won, but the conflict was not over. With extraordinary subtlety, a new attack struck suddenly at the foundations of the previous victory. The doubt persisted. It had still to be successfully challenged. Jesus was tempted to a practical demonstration of the trust he claimed. Moreover, the word to which Jesus had appealed was used to support the second test. In effect, the temptation was... You have acknowledged your confidence in God and in his word. Prove it by your actions. The word tells you that God will give his angels charge over you to keep you and prevent you dashing your foot against the stone. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple and show your confidence in that word and in your father if you are the son of God. This a spectacular demonstration will also be a dramatic opening to your mission and assure for you a national response. But Jesus answered with strength and courage. His reply, it is written again, must always be the response to those who rest isolated scriptures for their own ends. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. The context of the quotation showed that the children of Israel had repeatedly tempted the Lord by disobedience and distrust. Time and again they had rebelled against God by desire to go their own way. To have wavered before this temptation would have been to abandon at the outset the life of faith which Jesus came to live. He would have sought his own way to show himself to Israel rather than the spirit of waiting upon God. There had been a subtle omission in the quotation from the 91st Psalm. The promise was, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. The way Jesus trod was the way his father appointed. Any other way would be a faithless rebellion and a temptation of God. Jesus was to appeal to the people's wonder, not by a spectacular demonstration of power, but by so startling a manifestation of love that a hardened Roman officer was to cry, Surely this was the Son of God. He would give them a sign but it was not to be a public salvation acclaimed by thousands of delirious countrymen. It was to be a victory witnessed by lonely weeping women in the solitude of a garden. Such was the Father's way. And in this way Jesus was kept by the angels who were even now waiting to minister to him. In this victory, too, there is infinite encouragement for the disciple of every age to wait upon the Lord in patience and trust, neither beguiled by subtle sophistries nor tempted to subject his high relationship to artificial strains. These had been insidious attempt to undermine Christ's loyalty and strength of purpose. The final trial was devoid of any veneer of righteousness. It was an undisguised challenge to forsake the way of God and accept the temporal rewards of the flesh. Surveying the plains below him with their cities and villages, the roads winding away in the distance, highways to the farthest dominions of the earth, he felt the temptation surge within him to forsake the strange path of suffering and humility, and to use his power to bring all men to his feet. 
his sensitive mind would readily appreciate the universal benefits of such an action. The children of God would be freed from the oppressor's yoke, and all men would enjoy the blessings of peace and prosperity. Jesus was looking for a moment along the wide, straight way which leads to death. For an instant he contemplated its smoothness and its easy victories. Resolutely he turned towards the narrow, tortuous path that rose steeply up among the thorns and rocks to the only true destiny. The years of communion in Nazareth had again proved sufficient. Of no other man could the Spirit through the psalmist say, How sweet are thy words unto my taste! Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth! Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Idolatry may be disguised in rich robes, but it will not deceive those whose minds are stayed upon God. To attempt to achieve even the most laudable ends in conscious defiance of the way of God is a victory for the flesh. Jesus was not deceived. With a supreme and relentless discipline of spirit, he banished idolatry in all its forms. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Of the recorded temptations of Jesus, this last is the most prevalent and the most dangerous. We are confronted throughout our lives with the alternative of serving God or man. Although the Apostle John does not record the temptation of Jesus, it seems almost certain that it was in his mind as he closed his epistle with a moving appeal, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. With this final rebuke to fleshly desires, the temptations were over for a season. It could not be otherwise, so complete a victory could only end in the summary departure of the vanquished. And in the place of challenge and strife came the ministering angels of God, bringing with them the fruits of victory. The battle was over, and peace reigned. The victor emerged from the wilderness stronger than when he entered it. His resolution had taken the strain, and now he was ready for the work his father had committed to his trust.